go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for, for joining this HDO webinar on uh, Wave and Rush news updates. Um, we did one of these a few months ago, I think it was now, um, when the initial news broke. Um, for, for We did individual ones for, for Rush and then Wave. Um, but it's been a few months. We've had some more information that's came out since then um and we thought it would be good to kind of talk about that and explain those in a bit more uh a bit more detail so uh i'm not going to be doing that because i'm useless uh so uh that's why we've got carlos here and lauren from ucl who who can help us with this stuff very well so um can you allow me to share my screen Matt? yes i will uh carlos and lauren do you want to introduce yourselves in the meantime um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, you just have Lauren. Yeah. Oh, well, I just wanted to also remind people that this is being recorded, and um, I think everyone signed up to it when they registered. But just as a reminder, um, I am Lauren Byrne. I am a, a research fellow at the Huntington Disease Centre at University College London. I work with Carlos, um, and I'm also on the board of trustees for HDO, and I've been leading our new research committee. And recently I've been working on our joint HD study, which is going to be our registry, which is going to be the first uh, juvenile onset Huntington disease registry that will be global. Um, I'll pass over to Carlos. So, um, yeah, I'm Carlos Estes uh, Fraga. Uh, For a couple of years in, in HD, and then since 2018 I have been with Lauren in the in the HD Center doing my PhD and also um, in working in clinical trials with ASOs uh, in, in Huntington since 2018 until today, and hopefully for many years. Thank you, you two. Um, so just to say that, uh, so Carlos and Laura will be talking. Um, I will remain quiet for the most part. Um, but if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, so anyone who's watching here, who's kind of, if you've got a question already, whack it in there. Or if you think of one whilst, uh, whilst these two are talking, then whack it in there and we will go through them uh, with Carlos and Lauren later on. So thank you very much, folks, and enjoy. Over to you, Lauren and Carlos. So, Lauren, if you want, we can do, you can present the, um, yeah, yeah, since you have put so much slides, you can present everything and maybe I can add something at the end and then just let people ask. Does it sound okay to you, Lauren? Yes. Um, cool. I kind of put some slides together to give a bit of a, a, um, a background to the trials and kind of where we come from and, and then some of the new data, particularly for the Roche program. Um, it's not... Um, I haven't simplified a lot of it uh, yet, but we can talk. I've kind of put it here so myself and Carlos can, can explain some of the more complex stuff. Um, so feel free to ask any questions throughout, um, and we will try and get through them all. But um, so just going backwards back to March when we had the first few uh, announcements, on the 22nd from Roche, um, saying that they were stopping dosing within their Tom and Erson program. Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, because of this um, recommendation that they got from their independent data monitoring committee, um, and they reported that there were no new safety signals that were identified, but they, it was based on this completely independent group of, of scientists and experts that looked at the data before Roche did and gave them the the uh, told uh, recommended that they stop dosing of this um, new drug. Um, potential disease modifying therapy for Huntington's called Tom and Erson. And then one week later, we had another uh, announcement from WAVE, which was completely separate and just bad timing, I think, um, that uh, WAVE were stopping the development of two of their molecules, um, which um, were also drug candidates for HD. Um, and 
we were, were for completely different reasons. Um, but for the most part of these slides, I'm just going to focus on the Roche results because we have more information about that. Um, and we can touch on why they, the reasons for stopping these are, are completely different. Um, so we can get into that in a bit. So where are we now? I wanted to give some background to kind of just into Huntington Loring as a concept. Um, in 1872, George Huntington described Huntington's disease and reported it for one of the first times. Um, we were able to, we discovered DNA, or I say we scientists discovered DNA in 53. And then in 1953, a, a more important year for the Huntington's disease community was the discovery of the gene itself which was a huge collaborative effort of families and researchers across the globe to discover the single mutation that causes Huntington's disease. Um, and that allowed us to know exactly what goes wrong in this, this mutation, the CAG repeat expansion uh, that causes this mutant Huntington pro protein that is doing a lot of the damage and, and causing problems in the brain for Huntington's disease patients. But it's also the reason why um, some people have called Huntington's the most curable and curable brain disease um, for several reasons. So a year after the discovery of the gene was the first, um, the first mice model was generated. And uh, since then, there's been many different animal models that have been help, used to help us really understand what goes wrong in Huntington's disease. So we know that Huntington, the protein is involved in so many different parts of the, the body and, and the molecular makeup of our, our cells and is super important for many different functions. So that creates a lot of avenues for treatment, but um, it also is a rationale for why targeting Huntington itself is, is very important because it, it makes a lot of sense to turn off kind of the tap before uh, you try and uh, get rid of the flood of water. Um, and then years back, um, some clever scientists were able to make a, another mouse model that had a genetic switch that when the switch was on, the, hunting, the, the, sorry, the mice got sick and got Huntington's disease. But then they were able to turn the switch off, say with a certain type of food, and then the mice got better. And that was one of the first instances instances that showed that Huntington's could be manipulated and the course of disease could be modified. Um, so it brings us to Huntington lowering and where that, that that was really fundamental to a lot of these drug programs that are happening at the minute. Um, so a bit about kind of this idea of Huntington lowering. So I said earlier, we had we discovered the gene for Huntington's disease. And a gene is the instructions that to make a protein, and in this case, the Huntington protein. Um, and that's the, the protein that does the damage. Um, but it's a bit more complex than this. There's a message step in between. So we think of the gene, genes and the DNA is super important that the cells don't want to kind of mess up. So they're kept in the nucleus of the cells. And then a copy is made that is brought out to the factory part of our cells that make the protein. In both uh, the Roche Ionis program and the WAVE program, they both molecules are called antisense oligonucleotides. Um, you'll hear them called ASOs. And what they really are is just a single strand of artificial DNA. So scientists have, have um, generated these, these sequence that are that will specifically bind to certain parts of a of the message molecule. And what it does is then binds the message, which causes it to be degraded or destroyed, and that will subsequently reduce the amount of the protein that is produced. Um, the one thing about these molecules, because they're um, chemically like DNA, um, they can't be just taken in the mouth uh, because they'd be um, degraded by our bodies, enzymes and stomach. So they have, um, we're really trying to target the brain in Huntington's disease because that is where a lot of the pathology goes. Um, so both of these programs 
administer, administer the, the drug through what we call intrathecal injections or by spinal tap or lumbar punctures. So they, they inject the base of the spine and then it go, um, goes into this cerebrospinal fluid, which is aiding the brain. And, and we hope that it gets to a lot of the brain. Carlos has done many of these and can tell you a lot more about it if you want to know. Um, but that's just one thing to think about when we're talking about the ASO programs. So in 2015 um, was the first time a uh, Huntington lowering molecule was injected into a, a Huntington's disease patient by Ed and Blair there, um, which was a big thing for the community. Um, this is the first kind of drugs that have been really tailored for Huntington's disease itself and to try and um, get to the underlying mechanisms. In December 2017, I think a lot of us will remember a lot of headlines, or Huntington's making a lot of headlines across the world about being able to lower this deadly Huntington protein. And what that was, was in this first small pilot stage, or phase um, 1B2A trial, they were able to show that this drug, the uh, raw Shionis ISO was able to lower the amount of the Huntington protein in the spinal fluid, which was uh, the first time that's been done in humans and uh, was a proof of concept of the mechanism, but not necessarily the whether the drug could or whether lowering Huntington would uh, help Huntington's patients symptom wise, but it was still a huge thing for the community. And that, at that point, that was when Roche decided to license the drug and take over from Ionis. And that since then, um, it has been now named Tom and Erson and any of the updates that have been from Roche. It's all the same molecule that has gone through these stages. So after that, the patients that were in that first phase one trial went into an open label extension and that gave it uh, Roche and the people designing the next stages of the development a lot for information of longer term treatment um, and dosing of patients and deciding on whether or what the regime they will use in the, the next stage. They then decided to go straight to a phase three um, efficacy trial. Um, normally you go from phase one, two and three is different stages in, in drug development, but as there is, Huntington's has a huge unmet need, there's a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm to go with the data that was, the very good data that was shown in the earlier stages to go straight to a phase three. Um, and that started in 2018. So the Generation HD had a catchy name based on uh, some of the, the words that were used in the outline, what, the, the program was. Um, and this was one part of a large program of uh, for Roche. Um, then March 2021 happened. Um, and I, I don't need to kind of explain again what, what the results were in March, but I want to give you some information that was presented at the, the CHDI HD Therapeutics Conference back in April. Um, so that was uh, a presentation and I'm going to show, I've literally copied some of the slides that um, are publicly available from Scott Schogel's presentation, uh, which is with this, the preliminary results from the Generation HD Phase 3 trial. Um, these are publicly available um, and there's a link at the, you can see the barcode here. Um, and the video, fit, or the this presentation itself was recorded and should be available on the CHDI website uh, for anybody interested to, to see in it. But basically, um, Scott presented the scientific update um, and some of the data that led to the decision um, from the this um, independent data monitoring committee. So this is just um, the what we talked about back in March, um, the decision to, to stop dosing. Um, but then he went into some of the data behind that. And the, this was preliminary data, so it wasn't the end of the study. It was um, 
throughout a, a clinical trial, data is, is taken at, in intervals, um, so at different stages. Of, um, some patients have been th through more visits than other patients. So this was 60% of patients had reached the month 17 of the trial, the planned trial program. And um, what he presented was the CUHDRS um, and some of their components and some of the safety data. I'm not going to go into all of it, but I just wanted to highlight some of the things. So a reminder of what the UHDRS is, it's the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale. And some of you will have done this if you took part in, in Roll HD or other trials. Um, and it's the a clinician will check um, do different things like getting you to walk in a straight line or finger tapping and um, that's the for the motor score but then there's also checking your ability to do your finances or work um, and also some of the thinking tests and cognitive tests that you might recognize from from that and the their primary endpoint was this composite so a combined score of, of these four um, subcomponents of the UHDRS um, and what they found was that those on the uh, under, can, I, can you see my cursor? Yes, we see it, Lauren. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, you can see in blue is um, individuals that were on uh, eight week dosing regime, so every eight weeks they got the drug, whereas the orange is every 16 weeks they got the drug and those that were on placebo and grey. Um, everyone was, that got the drug had the same dose of the 120 milligrams, so it was the highest dose that was tested in the original phase one study. At the initial points we don't see much difference, but once we get to 53 and 67 or 69 weeks, we see that there seems to be a, uh, those at the highest or the most frequent dosing seem to get work, their clinical symptoms got more worse than the placebo. Um, so they also showed some of the safety data um, and there's kind of reams of that and it's hard to kind of make anything out of um, the slides. But what they did see is that there was more um, adverse events in the uh, eight week regimen. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos can maybe talk about those if we have any questions afterwards. Um, and they also show this increased ventricular atrophy without brain atrophy. Um, which is significant in that it would be unexpected in Huntington's disease progression for the ventricles, which are the kind of the holes in the middle of the brain that contain some of the spinal fluid. These get big, these get larger through the course of Huntington's disease, um, at the same time as the whole brain or the, the brain volume gets smaller. Um, but we only see that it's the ventricles that um, get larger here, whereas there wasn't a significant difference in the whole brain volume or the caudate, which is uh, a part of the brain that's affected most in Huntington's disease. So this is kind of the summary. They didn't see a clinical, they saw clinical worsening in the eight week group compared to placebo, and they didn't see any benefit at the 16 week regimen. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this could be, but there's still a lot of data to come. Um, so they only had this, these clinical outcomes. They didn't have any of the uh, biomarker data, for example, the Huntington levels and the neurofilament levels. Um, and they have lots of different hypotheses that could be um, behind this. And we can discuss some of this after if anybody has any questions. Um, but one thing I took away from this com this conference and this meeting was that they are committed to in looking at the data and exploring all of these possible reasons. And if they choose to continue with Tom and Urshin or not continue with it, it will because 
it won't be because they haven't done looked at the data and, and worked on it. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Oh, um, <laughs> another slide uh, from another presentation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, um, so we do have a question um, before we probably go on to talk a little bit about WAVE, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question that came in from Juliana, which was asking, so in your opinion, does the lack of efficiency in the Tom Nelson indicate that Huntington lowering in general does not change disease progression? Or do you think that it just needs to be tweaked? Yeah. That's a big um, question, I, isn't it? Do you want to go, Carlos, yeah. and I can... Yeah, right can now. I show one? Actually, I, I just read it, and I have just prepared... I have one here. I hope uh, that question. Let me just show it. So um, I will try to share my screen, which is something that I absolutely always do, do wrong. So let me give it a try. If I don't have here... Lauren, you might need to make him host, actually. Uh, that was... Uh, Lauren's that was blocking already. you, don't worry. Shall we start that? <laughs> I think I've made, made it you able to share. I think all panelists can... Share the screen, okay. Let me yeah. try. So, hopefully you are seeing a slide full of uh, screenshots now. Are you? So um, this is a um, so it's a question that um, is quite pertinent now. The, this thing about the hunting. So we have like a lot of hope in two trials, Wave and and Roche. And suddenly, within two weeks, we have this terrible news. We get like huge impact in, in all of us. So there is like like of course the, this concern is not only your concern; it's a concern that uh, many many people have. And the the thing is that there are first two things. So one, as Lauren said before. The reasons for the trial to fail are completely different. First, we, we still have to know a little bit more about the Roche program, but the Roche program had target engagement, meaning that it was able to decrease the mutant hunting team, but then it was not clinically effective. Because, and that, that can be caused by a lot of reasons, and they have to do like a lot of analysis, and they will let us know hopefully by the end of this year. The WAVE program is completely different. They basically weren't able to decrease mutant hunting team. So the drug. It's not that it was able to decrease mutant hunting pain and it didn't have like an impact on patients that they didn't get to that point. They weren't able to to to, to decrease mutant hunting. So it's completely different. But apart from that, the thing is that we know that HD is caused by a single mutation and all the cases of HD are caused, are caused by this mutation. And this mutation, as Lauren said, encodes for a protein. And we know that that protein causes the disease. There is like like quite a lot of literature showing, a lot of studies, a lot of groups throughout the years showing how having the mutant hunting in many mouse models, many, um, I don't know, many, many, many animal models um, 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 causes neurodegeneration. We know that for sure. There's no, we're completely uh, certain about that. But not only that, is that um, um, the, the good news is that, and there are many good news still, um, we have like multiple groups um, uh, in multiple places using different animal models in different disease stages with different technolo technologies that have decreased mutant hunting team and they have shown a, a, a benefit and they have shown benefit in many areas. And here you have, this is just, this was, I, mean, I don't want to um, give you like too much information, but then um, uh, this has been ordered like these studies from the, I think it's, 90 something, beginning of 2000s, and this study was published last year, and this one this, this year. And all these studies by different groups with very robust uh, um, methodologies in very good journals, they have shown that decreasing mutant hunting team improves motor symptoms, and we have like many animal models, improves uh, cognitive symptoms, improves behavioral symptoms. Not only that, it improves atrophy over time, it improves um, like the the so when when we look at the brains of these mice, uh, we see that the, the the those brains don't have mutant hunting into into their brains after uh, using these techniques, 
And this has been shown using like thin finger proteins, which are expected to reach clinical trials next year, different ASOs, uh, CRISPR. So we have like a lot of approaches. And this is just an example of that that showing that we have like a lot of evidence showing that mutant Huntington lowering is the approach to push you. And so I'm really, uh, I really think that is still the answer. I mean, it's, it's of course good always to have other alternatives, but we know like, we know that the, the protein causes the disease is because of a gain of function mainly. So having the protein causes that. And we know that decreasing it, decreasing the protein uh, um, um, uh, is expected to improve the symptoms of the patient. The thing is that there, there may be many, many other questions. Is the dose of the ASO was too high? Is this, if it's too low? This thing about the decreasing the good hunting thing apart from decreasing the mutant hunting thing. Those are questions that we still have, we have to answer and we don't have enough information. But I'm, I still think that this is not the end of a uh, hunting team lowering approaches. I don't know if you agree with me, uh, Lauren. Yeah, definitely. And I would add to that that for me and my from my research experience and this work that I do in some of the biomarkers like neurofilament light and Huntington, which we don't yet have that data for this trial. Um, but there's a lot more reasons uh, that make sense to me that would lead to clinical decline with the, the eight-week regimen. Um, one example of that is the neurofilament light biomarker, which I can, um, I think I can share one of the, the share the slide that um, Scott um, presented. Which one are you seeing? No, not this one, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Can we have Schwarzenegger back, please? <laughs> so um, this, the first um, thing underneath here is neurofilament in the cerebrospinal fluid in the phase one. And they saw in the 90 and the 120 milligram dose, this increased neurofilament that went, that when they looked at the open label extension and those people that weren't on the drug that did go on to it had the same increase. Um, but after continued dosing of Huntington, uh, of the, sorry, of Tom and Erson, um, so continued exposure to Huntington lowering, this spike went down. Um, so that suggests to me that keeping Huntington low doesn't um, necessarily keep this, whatever event happened at the start of, of the dosing, um, I don't think that's because of increased or min, uh, continued Huntington lowering. And what I would say in terms of what neurofilament means to, in terms of an increase of it, in other diseases and in brain injury that you get increases in neurofilament after a concussion, after brain trauma, and in even outside of Huntington's disease, that would cause clinical impacts a year down the line or can cause outcomes that, that are clinically meaningful in a, in a bad way. Um, and if, if whatever has happened at the start of this has caused an increase in neurofilament, that suggests that there's some kind of damage or injury that is it is transient, in which I mean that it doesn't last, but after continued dosing, but something's happening that we need to understand. That makes sense to me why the eight-week regime, which has a higher um, peak of neurofilament than the 16-week, um, that, well, actually, we need to, to confirm that with the biomarker data, but I imagine it will just based on what we see with the eight week and the uh, this eight week and four week here from the original open label extension. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that there is greater disease worsening in those patients. I would be interested to know whether if they kept on being dosed, you know, two years or three years, whether they would it would balance out. But I think there's a good rationale for the clinical decline being related to some kind of injury and, and toxicity. 
that's not to say that it's that you know that this drug might have a, a kind of toxic limit that we haven't understood yet so it could be that we need to go to lower dose um it might be that they need to dose less frequently um but we need more data and we need the biomarker data for um Roche to make those decisions and to understand what those reasons are but i'm um pretty hopeful still on that front in terms of i don't think it's the end of tom and Erson yet and i definitely don't think it's the end of huntington lowering um yeah. thank you um so just to kind of talk a little bit about the differences between the rush and the wave uh, approach and, and the the therapy there uh, can we spend a few minutes just talking about well, what's different between the rush treatment and wave one and uh although it was similar results in the end, sort of, for different reasons. Yeah. And you have this, okay. So, um, we know that it, if you have Huntington's disease, um, or if your parent has Huntington's disease, you have a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. That's because we all have two copies of every gene that we have, and in Huntington's disease case, you only need one copy of this bad, and in this case, it's the, this pink one from the affected mother, and this child is gene positive because they received the bad copy. Um, so these copies produce both the good and bad Huntington protein. So we have an, um, the healthy wild type Huntington protein in blue, and then we have the toxic bad protein in pink. WAVE are taking an approach where they're trying to only target the bad copy. Um, so they specifically target those. So if that makes sense, they have, they've tailored or designed their drugs to bind to specific parts of the Huntington protein and they can make sure by testing the patients before they come into the trial, whether they have those SNPs or, or tags um, that they'll that they have it on their bad copy, so they'll only need to um, reduce that and not the the um, the healthy copy. Um, and what you might hear this called allele selective approach. So when we say copies um, of a gene, they're alleles. Um, scientists call them alleles. So if you ever hear that, that's where that comes from. Um, whereas uh, Roche's uh, lowers both copies, so it doesn't have um, any selectiveness. So it's going to lower both the good and bad Huntington. So we don't know if that's going to be problematic either. Yeah, if I may add something um, apart from that, so there are um, a couple more differences. So the the NHD one was a phase three trial, so it means if the results were positive, the drug was going to be approved, hopefully. Whereas the precision HD1 was just much more preliminary, was a phase one to study. And then, although the patients were, were similar, there is also a, an important connotation be, be, between this uh, allele selective or not allele selective approach. So first is that uh, these drugs that uh, are being tested by WAVE, as Lauren said, they depend on targeting one thing called the uh, SNPs or SNPs in your DNA. So each of these drugs is approximately can be used in like 30% of the HD population. So it's not for everyone. They have to test you. And if you have that um, genetic uh, um, uh, change, you can use as one, one of these drugs. They, they think that possibly using developing like three ASOs in parallel, they may be able to target almost everyone. So that's why they have different trials. And then, and then there is another, another the uh, um, thing is that, they, yes, Lauren said that it's, they didn't even reach, weren't able to decrease the mutant hunting team, but uh, there is another good thing, uh, which is they are developing a new one, a new ASO that targets a different um, um, SNP, and it's, it has like improved, the, they have like optimized the molecule and are targeting another SNP. So, um, that and they are going to start trials soon. So even even from that sense, also from that sense, there is a still hope. And this thing about highly selective or non-highly selective is important because um, 
we know that the good protein, the protein that everyone without the mutation has, and that uh, people with the mutation also have, like in the in the allele uh, in the genetic mutation inherited from the healthy uh, father or mother. The problem is that we don't know the function in the adult brain of that protein. Possibly, uh, uh, it is possible. It will be not problematic to decrease it uh, to decrease the levels of the good protein, like in the long term. But that, but hypothetically, that could be potentially harmful. So that's why some companies are are are, are going through this a little selective uh, approach. But it's so each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. And I think it's worth pursuing both approaches, actually. Any more questions? Um, I was very curious to kind of understand what people's biggest worries were with results, because I it's just a it's definitely a lot of bad news in a week or in the space of a week, but. I don't think it's as bad as it seems, um, but it's always going to be hard when things are taking so long. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see if anyone yeah. puts something in. I do have a question for my for myself. Of course, I, I keep these uh, ready to go. Um, it basically was just kind of going off from from what Juliana was saying as well. Um, so we've seen in these past months that. The Roche trial has, has tried and, and failed at some, to some extent, and, and the WAVE trial has done, done the same. There were slightly different ASO approaches, but both kind of have failed, quote-unquote. Um, for the HT community, yeah, it doesn't feel great to get that, to, to get that uh, all going like that. And it, and it does, I can totally understand what Juliana's question is, because... Yeah, it, it's scary for the community to think, okay, well, is this working? Uh, because people were very excited about this approach um, and very hopeful. And I think there's a lot of concern. People now just wondering if this, this whole this whole kind of approach is going to work or is going to provide something, or is it worth even considering going down that road more? Um, but then again, you've got companies like Wave who are doing their third drug on this, so they obviously think that they can do something. But um, so. so, are you specifically asking about whether going back specifically Huntington lowering or ASOs in general? ASOs in general for Huntington's, uh, because obviously we've seen that it works so, in, in mice, but but. So one thing I would say about ASOs in terms of um, being suitable to treat diseases. Um, we know in other diseases there's um, SMA and I think ALS now that have approved drugs that are ASO based. So it, there are different molecules and different ASOs have different toxicities and by changing one sequence and one things. So that's something that needs to really be looked at and whether so that there could be a, a toxicity just purely of the chemistry of the molecule that is nothing to do with Huntington lower itself. There could be toxicity produced because you've lowered Huntington, but you know I think there's. I'm more convinced that it, because of the continued Huntington lowering and then the the neurofilament going down, I'm on. The, this is my personal opinion, and um, there's no not enough evidence yet to to back this up. It's just from what I was thinking. I'll answer um, Sandra's question. She um, just mentioned um, uh, that, that I was interested in the uh, whether a lower dose with the frequency or length of trial would provide you know some results. Um, and Ed, I me and Ed talk about this a lot. Ed Wild, um, he tweeted that it might be a case of the micrograms or the dosage. Um, and Sandra just wanted to know when do we think we will know if any of the any trials or extension trials in that regard. So in terms of what Roche are planning in terms of getting more information and more data out, they have openly said that they are the next time they will present data will be at the EHDN uh, meeting, which is a virtual meeting which everybody can sign up to, family members can can sign up to. So I recommend that. And that is in I think the 9th or 10th of September. So that will be the next round of data that we get. And I, 
they are really trying to work fast to get all of the mutant Huntington and neurofilament data from all the, the, bio, the CSF biomarkers and other um, outcome measures ready to analyze and be ready to present at that. So there will probably be still a limit of what they are is ready to present at that stage. They've also agreed that they will present at the Huntington study group meeting, which is also going to be virtual. So um, look out for that. I think it's free for family members to sign up to these. So I definitely recommend signing up But that. We will um, probably do um, round up seminar after those meetings as well to discuss anything that comes out. But um, in terms of planning future trials, it, you can't really, on, until they've looked at the data, if they can see any, find any signal that suggests that there's any benefit of going forward with Tom and Urshan, they will go forward in it. They want, you know, they want a drug that works as much as, you know, they might have it for different reasons, whether it's financial reasons, but at the end of the day, drug companies didn't want the drug to work so they, you know, can sell it. And so um, they will definitely, and, and Roche being the kind of giant that they are in the pharmaceutical industry will leave no stone unturned. So I'm really feel strongly that we'll figure out whether Tom and Erson works or not because at the minute, it's still too early to say. Yeah, I don't know if I also, it. Yeah. And that, um, I mean, it makes sense that the, we were all like, this is the first drug that um, has been tested in, in humans target, like trying to decrease uh, mutant hunting. This is the first drug. So the excite, uh, we were like all like, mm, I couldn't be more excited about this. I would dream about this every, uh, many days. So we were all very, very excited. And when the, when the expectations are so high, the disappointment, if things don't work, um, um, it's also quite uh, marked. But this was the first one. And um, there are many others coming, and some of them are starting trials this year. So this will be, and in many diseases, as Lauren says, so first, drugs from the same family have been approved in other, in other conditions. So it, this is not like the ESOs are not useful. No, we know that they have been useful in other conditions, so they may well be useful for, for HD. But also we have other technologies that are going to target mutant hunting thing with completely radical approaches, like one that is given uh, into the brain after one of the uh, intracranial surgery, another one which is another ESO that is administered also well into the ventricles, which is another part of the brain. Uh, then we have this microRNA from Unicure that is a different approach also administered through the inside the brain and that has started clinical trials already. So if those would, were the first drugs that, we, that they, uh, were in development, the excitement would be the same as the ones uh, uh, as they said, that we would be as excited as um, uh, the way we were, we were with, the, with the ESO. So I know it's difficult and the... Uh, uh, um, and I know that the impact, I mean, I have seen it in my patients, so the impact has been huge, but uh, this is by far completely not the end of the road, completely not the end of the road. I'm positive of that. So. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Caitlin's just asked uh, to get the information on the event in September. Caitlin, I've put it, it's um, EHDN is the one in September. Um, and I've put the website in the chat for you. Um, and yeah. then the one after that is the Huntington Study Group. Um, both should be accessible. Um, it's their, no um, their annual meeting. So yeah. oh, EHDN has one every two years, but um, yeah, uh, HDN's plenary meeting. Um, but it should be on their, advertised on their main website. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is he called Schwarzenegger? <laughs> uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, we're still, I mean, just to summarize, and, and Carlos, you were talking about uh, future treatments as well and future uh, future studies coming through. Um, and there is a lot coming through, obviously, and, and we have to be we have to be hopeful about that. Um, um, we're still in a position of where we're quite fortunate in HD, I think, um, to have these opportunities coming up and to have the kind of uh, funds that we have uh, to kind of support HD research. Um, not many are in that kind of position uh, from other conditions. So we, we are fortunate, but 
um, we're also hopeful and we also I think we have to be forgiven for getting hyped about about things that come along because we're all hoping for for breakthroughs aren't we um, but I think with there's more to come hopefully more good news to come than bad news in the future fingers crossed Thank you, Dr. Carlos and Dr. Lauren. I appreciate that. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I wish. We're using we get, different we presentations. Get to see that slide. That's still, 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 I'm it was going to be, and it, was, it came from, I don't know if you've seen Ed's um, reference to uh, Alien. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, I did see it before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's through uh, yeah. that. So. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. We'll wait once it's done. Okay, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you all taking the time here, and I hope that was useful in some capacity. Um, and yeah, um, maybe we'll see you in a few more months' time when we've got more information. We'll see. Um, yeah. But thank you so much, everybody. And uh, yeah, have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have thank many you so much. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.